Mary brings a perspective, really, that no one else could claim. It's the perspective of the one who was there at, really, the, the very first moments of the promise as it was given, the expectant moments that carried Jesus into this world and then carried him through life. She stood at the foot of the manger, but also at the foot of the cross. No one else can make that claim. No one else had that perspective. No one else saw through those eyes. Now, there are a lot of moments in between as well, and some of those are recorded in Scripture, and they help flesh out the story for us. They help us understand what is going on and, and the depth of the, the, the pain and agony that, that happened at the cross. And in, in so many ways, as we tell the story, there, there's just no way for us to avoid what we're about to encounter. We tell the story to help us understand what we mean when we say words like cross and sacrifice and grace and redemption and salvation. It helps us when we tell the Easter story next Sunday and we celebrate the fullness of God's redemption to the lowest of the low, the toughest of the tough, the depths of suffering. When we, when we say that Jesus rose from the dead, it will be through the lens of those who have also seen the cross. And so we have to tell the story. Today's the day we tell this story. And this is the week that we live into it. Mary was there all along the way. She saw things that no one else saw. And those little uh, small tender moments that we do capture at Christmas. The, worm, the moments that go beyond words between a mother and a son. Those tender moments that, that are shared between a baby and his mother. Most of us are, are influenced by those kinds of moments, though we don't often remember them. It's part of God's grace, part of God's provenient grace. Very often that, that God's at work in our lives before we recognize it, before we know it, and those moments shape us. My mom tell, loves to tell the story of me I was, as a baby. I was not uh, a very happy baby at times. I had a lot of ear problems, and so I would be up in the middle of the night. I, I, I would live my, the first five years of my life uh, in a trailer on our family farm. And uh, my mom would walk me up and down the hallway of the, of the trailer between the living room and the bedroom and just try to comfort me. That The trailer had those little windows, you know, that you roll out like this, you know, like to have a crank on them. Some of you have no idea what I'm talking about. Um, and she would be carrying me like this, and every once in a while my head would bop one of those <laughs> handles. So, you know, it's never a perfect process for, for any of us. Those early moments shape us. Mary, as we have heard this morning, brings all kinds of expectations and hopes to Jesus that are bigger than just the hopes and expectations of a mother. It's the hope and expectation of a God who has spoken. <coughs> and she, as she sings the lullabies into his ears before he can remember, before he can know, is singing God's song. Singing a song of, re of redemption of God's hope and God's power over all things that might separate us from him. She planted seeds in her baby that would bring forth the fruit of Jesus' ministry. She was there along other moments as well. The Bible records a few of those. One of those, I, I always had thought as, as a child, I remember reading the story as a child and, and kind of laughing. It's, it's, a, it's just sort of an honest story. When Jesus is 12 or so, they go, as they, as they are doing in the story of the the, of Palm Sunday going into Jerusalem, uh, as a 12-year-old, they go in for Passover, and they, get, they go into Jerusalem, and they have a big time, and then they leave, and then uh, as they're out and away from town, they realize that Jesus is not with them. And so that mom and, mom and dad now have to go back and find Jesus, and Jesus, as this young adult, is in the temple schooling the experts in the temple, and they're, like, they're kind of like, you know, it's one of those moments where they're happy they found him, but they can't believe that that he's, you know, not, not been a little more responsible. And when they, when they sort of discipline him, he's, he says to them, well, where did you expect me to be except in my father's house? Can you imagine the look that Mary gave Jesus <laughs> when he said that? You know, moms have that look, right? And, and I don't know if there's like a mom school where they're trained to do this or if it's just passed down from generation to generation as this sacred and powerful thing uh, yesterday we were spending some time as a family and it really uh, was sort of a, a good-natured argument going on between Jenny and one of our kids. And they were going to go on at it back and forth, kind of enjoying that little back and forth a little bit. And then I, I heard my wife say, wait a second. 
And no joke, she had sunglasses on, so she needed, she needed to employ her powers. So she said, wait a second, and she pulled the sunglasses down to her nose. She doesn't even know she did it, and she gave him the look. It's just this natural thing. Can you imagine the look that Mary gave Jesus whenever he told her that he just had to be about his father's business? I think of the, the look that Jesus probably got when he was about to perform his first miracle, at a wedding at Cana, just a, a family event, everybody's there, mom's there, and they run out of wine. And to keep the party going, they need more wine. And apparently Mary thought we needed to keep the party going. So she, she turns to Jesus and gives him the look. And Jesus, you can imagine, uh, you know, it's translated in the Bible. Sometimes you have to sort of read between the lines. And he's like, shh, mom, not now. She knows what he can do. She knows what he's about. She's waiting in expectation. He's trying to, Mom, it's not time yet. And then she gives him the look again. And then turns to the servers and has this little look in her eye and says, do whatever he tells you. And he did what Mama wanted. He, he met her expectations. You know, one of the other times that Mary is mentioned actually in, in the events of Jesus is after his death. The final time that, that Mary is mentioned in the Bible is in the book of Acts. As the church is being formed and birthed and the Holy Spirit comes down in Pentecost, the, Acts tells us that Mary was there and she saw it happen. And we have to think all the way back to that moment when she and the angel were it. She has carried this promise all the way through from a one-on-one -on -one encounter to a worldwide movement. She saw it all. She bridged the gap. A peasant girl. A woman. A mother. John tells us that Mary was there present for the crucifixion. <clears throat> the other time that Mary, the mother of Jesus, is mentioned in the book of, of John, is at the cross. And so we remember at the beginning of the service how we call, uh, how Holy Week began. We can imagine Mary perhaps watching those, those events um, happening. You know, it's, it's funny how moms can look at us, with, and part of that look may be that they're, they're proud and they humble us at the same time. I don't know how, how that happens. You can imagine the tension that she felt as other people celebrated her son, and she, more than anyone else, knew the, the, the full expectation that God was going to do something. And then, uh, as John describes, as uh, Jesus was mocked, and as he was tortured and flogged, we have to think about that, that expectation that Jesus would be part of God bringing down all these powers all the forces of the world that go against God and bring down those who are high and make them low. And you have to wonder what she thought. Was it really going to happen? Or was, or was evil going to win again as her son was led to a cross and then nailed to it? It's unbearable to think about. Jesus, the word made flesh, treated with violence and hatred by the creatures that he loved, and dying for those he came to save and John says, standing at the foot of the cross was his mother. Standing at the foot of the cross was his, was his, was his mother. A 14th century hymn called the Stabat Mater says, this is a, 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 a Catholic hymn. At the cross, her station keeping stood the mournful mother weeping close to Jesus to the last. By the cross with thee to stay, there with thee to weep and pray. Make me feel as thou hast felt. Make my soul to glow and melt with the love of Christ my Lord. Let me share with thee his pain, who for all my sins was slain, who for me in torments died. Let me mingle tears with thee, mourning him who mourned for me all the days that I may live. At this painful moment, as Jesus is literally hanging from the cross, he looks down and sees his mother. And the Bible captures this exchange between Mary and, then, and Jesus' beloved disciple, we think it was John, as he turns to Mary and says, look at John, he's your son. And then to John, look, Mary's your mother. 
And that exchange captures the, the sort of the relational agony of the moment as he takes care of business and makes sure Mary is cared for, as he makes connections between important relationships in his own life, and as he prepares, as he prepares to leave, as he prepares to die. Mary stood and watched her son die. And you can imagine she was scared of no one. She had nothing left to lose, but there was nothing she could do. So she stood, perhaps in silence, and was present, bringing with her the hope and the expectation and the faith that only God could do what needed to be done. Why does the Christian story of salvation involve a mother? Not only a cross, not only a man who died, not only the death of God's son, not only the execution of someone who is innocent, but also a mother standing in her grief. Could it be that Mary helps us see what we would rather not see? You know, so often I think of um, the tragedies that we tell about people, and we sort of get used to hearing about this on the news, um, things that happen to people, and the state of things uh, that sometimes is the reality of someone's life. And I don't think we always understand what's going on. We don't always see, we become immune to it, right? We gloss over it, we pass over it, and tr truth be told, we don't want to get too close because it's painful. You know, every once in a while we'll see a picture on the news of someone who has been arrested for something or a drug charge or whatever. A few years ago, I was watching uh, my, my Facebook feed, and one of those news uh, clips came up from my hometown. And the person in the picture was my family member. Uh, a person that I love, who I knew was struggling, and who had been literally the most beautiful child on the face of the planet when she was little. I had known her all her life, and she was just like a doll as a baby, just beautiful. And here she was, uh, arrested for, for drug charges. And one of those pictures that looks like somebody else, you know what I mean? Th those pictures that we're kind of used to seeing, that look that happens from meth or whatever, that just sort of is a person who's slowly destroying their life. And it was like, oh my gosh, I've looked at all of those other pictures wrong. I didn't see it. I didn't get it. So what I've tried to do um, since then and, and at different times with different levels of success, honestly, is to look at those kinds of pictures or hear the story on the news and tell myself, that's someone's child. There's someone who, who held that baby in the expectation that this child would, would grow into everything that God would want. A mothers and fathers carry maybe a, more than anybody else the, the closest thing to the expectations that God has for every single one of his children. And when it's not that, it's not good. It's not right. It's not something that's part of God's plan. It's not something that we can just say is okay we might distance ourselves from it, but the cross doesn't allow us to do that. And certainly looking at the cross through Mary's eyes helps us see what we would rather not see. The reality of sin and hate and violence and all its tragic ugliness. Could it be that Mary gives us a picture of faith and trust in the most gut-wrenching of circumstances? Maybe that's why she's so clearly in the story. She helps us see what, what sometimes we have to do or are or, or forced to do. Uh, what Parker Palmer calls stand in the tragic gap between the expectations that we bring to our lives and to our families and the ones we love and the reality that we cannot fix. Sometimes faith calls us to simply stand in that gap and trust that God and God alone can act. I think Mary did that. Not in a sentimental way, but in the most painful, love that suffers sort of way. She stood in the tragic gap, waiting for God to do what only God could do. Could it be that Mary helps us see the cross for what it really is? It just wa wasn't just a man who was killed, it was someone's son. We don't know what to do with that level of suffering. We don't know how to, to explain it. And truth be told, we don't have words for it. And so this part of the story takes us to that level of faith and level of experience in life that's beyond words. Mary stood at the foot of the cross. There's nothing left to say. 
There's nothing left to do. She stands in silence. We don't know, know what to do with that suffering, and so we must trust that God does. And truth be told, if, if the story is what we say it is, then it must include a mother grieving for her, her son. It must include God's answer or God's hope for that level of pain and loss. If Jesus died to redeem all sin and all suffering, then Mary is a picture of that. Mary, the first disciple, the, really probably the first Christian, and the only one who saw all of it play out, stands at the foot of the cross. She's present. She represents something that goes beyond words. She's the embodiment of those expectations and anguish, the hope and the sacrifice, the unconditional love and the unthinkable loss. There are no words for times like these. Mary represents when our need goes beyond words. She represents waiting for God to do what God alone can do in our own lives. And in so many ways, that is what Holy Week is about. Beginning in the expectations that God will do and finding at the end of the week that it's harder than we thought and ultimately coming a week later to God's answer that is beyond our comprehension in the resurrection of Jesus. There are tragic aspects of your own life. Sin and brokenness and shame and hurt. And many of us spend 51 weeks a year trying to work through that. Trying to find answers for it. Trying to think ourselves out of it. Trying to talk our way through it. Today we do something else. In fact, this week, let me encourage you to do none of that. But to simply sit in your brokenness or stand w with Mary and trust that God will, will do what only God can do. The, the story of the cross allows us to bring the most tragic aspects of our own lives and our own experience. It helps us to wrestle with the challenges that come with suffering and death. Today we re received the word that one of our retired pastors, the father of one of our members, passed away this morning. And so we joined together <clears throat> as we grieve those who have lost fathers and mothers and family members, as we even celebrate God's ultimate healing and the promise of resurrection and celebrate the faithfulness of so many saints who have gone before us. Today, many of us are grieving the loss of a child in our community. And we're trusting God for our friends, Jeff and Jana and Maggie Goodnight, and the loss of their son, Mason. Some of you know their grief. And many of you will stand in line today or tomorrow and join them in their grief that goes beyond words. What do you say to a parent that's lost a child? There, there, are, there are no words. Mary gives us a model for how to be present in that level of suffering. To stand in the hope and the faith that God must do what only God can do. No words are necessary. In fact, the thing that we can do in those kinds of moments is to stand with people and cry with them and trust with them and perhaps for them in their shock and in their grief. And to believe to be people of faith in ways that do go beyond words. To carry with us this faith that God will act for the worst of the worst. To carry the expectation and hope that Mary carried, that God can and God will. And then go to the place that is beyond our control, beyond our, our words, beyond our fixing, and offer it to God. I'm going to call the band up. And I want to give you a way to respond to this message today that is symbolic of, uh, of what we've been describing there are times when we must refrain from words, actually, and simply gather up our faith and our trust and our hope and in, in silence stand before God, waiting for God to act. Holy Week is one of those times. Parker Palmer tells the story uh, in his book, A Hidden Wholeness, a book I would recommend to pretty much anybody, uh, of a colleague at a psychology conference. Uh, and you can, you know, kind of imagine how that might be. You think of a bunch of shrinks getting together in their cardigan sweaters and writing notes and analyzing and psychoanalyzing people and providing answers to their problems. I looked at a counselor just now, and I did not mean to uh, discredit your work in any way. 
Sorry. <laughs> um, I've been to counseling, and it's very helpful. <laughs> but in this conference, uh, at this conference, uh, what they were doing, it had a panel of experts and, um, and, and, and well-known psychologists who were helping uh, talk through some issues. And they get, it just had cards that they were reading that people had written to offer up to this panel and, and the, the crowd and, and the people who were at the conference were listening. And uh, someone brought up the card, and they read a, of a person's dream, a recurring dream, a nightmare, actually, where, where this person had experienced uh, almost nightly the, the, the atrocities of the Holocaust. And it was their own personal anguish that they could not get out of this, and night after night were, were experiencing it as if it were the first time. And this colleague of uh, Parker Palmer uh, was there, and she imagined that uh, even as the, the card was being written, she was making her notes of things that you would say and just issues that are at play and all those things. And she was anticipating what the, the panel of experts would say to this experience. And when it was over, the leader of the panel said, here's what I'd like for you to do. I'd like for everyone to, to stand. And everyone in the place stood. And he said, I'd like to ob observe a full one minute of silence in response to the suffering we have just heard. And his colleague said that as they were going through the moment of silence, she was thinking, okay, now when this is over, everybody will sit down and then they'll start going through. And this is the, some of the things that they would say. These are the, some of the things I would say. And um, when it was over, when the full minute was, was complete, the, the, the leader of the panel said, okay, I'd like to invite everybody to sit down again. And then they moved on to the next question. And the colleague was, uh, was so distraught by that because she felt like there needed to be some guidance for, for this person, and um, she actually went to her mentor, and she said, I need to understand this, and, and he had some words for her. He said, you know, there is in life a suffering so unspeakable, a vulnerability so extreme, it goes far beyond words, beyond explanations, and beyond our version of healing. In the face of such suffering, all we can do is bear witness so no one needs suffer alone. I think that's what I think that's what Mary does for us. I think it is what God has done for us and is one of the greatest gifts we can give to each other. And so that's our response today. The cross is a symbol of our suffering. It's a, a symbol of God's own unspeakable suffering and the extreme vulnerability of the one who came for us, who would die for us. And in the face of the level of violence and atrocity and hurt and pain that we see in Jesus, and in Mary, and in one another, there is a healing that goes beyond words, beyond explanations. Our response today is to stand with Mary in the shadow of the cross and wait for God to act. Now, there will be opportunities to do this this week. Uh, Holy Week has some of those inherent to it. One of those is our Holy Thursday service, or Maundy Thursday service, that will be here um, in um, the sanctuary, the newly renovated sanctuary at 645 on Thursday, where we walk through the last uh, moments of Jesus' life, starting with the, the upper room uh, dinner on, on, on Thursday night. There will be moments maybe along the way that you can take where you can just be quiet and, and listen, uh, to, to take a little time this week. To, to be silent and reverent and, um, and wait for God to act in your own life. But today is a chance for us to do this with Mary. So what I'd like to do is invite you to stand, and we're going to observe a full minute of silence before the cross. I know we don't do that very often. It's sort of an, uh, it's going to feel maybe strange in some ways. But it allows us to stand with Mary, to stand in light of Mary's pain, which is symbolic of our own, to stand with the mother that was at the cross, to stand in solidarity, solidarity with her and with all who suffer and grieve today, and with God, whose love led him to the cross. And in so uh, gathering our faith, we'll wait for God to do what God alone can do. Let's observe a moment of silence.